My name is Penny Dreadful. A morning wind has cleared the nighttime mist that shrouded the old mansion, and, seen from the cliffs, the sea and sky share a summer blue that obscures the far horizon, hinting, perhaps, that the boundary dividing earth and heaven has been dissolved. But the boundaries that separate life from death will soon be removed altogether, unleashing terror at Collinwood. Be careful, my friend, where you tread. For I warn you now, there are spoilers ahead. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Penny Dreadful, a.k.a. Danielle. I don't know who I am anymore. It doesn't really matter. But we're here to celebrate Dark Shadows, and I have two fantastic guests today. I have RJ Jameson and Steve Schutt. Uh, RJ Jameson is a longtime enthusiast of the theater, film, and opinionated redheads. She authored the definitive 2006 biography of 1964 Oscar nominee and Dark Shadows lead actress, Grayson Hall. RJ grew up in Russell, Kansas, and attended McPherson College. She has written technical and biographical articles for various venues. In addition, she co-wrote Barnabas and Company with the late Craig Hamrick and was instrumental in helping to complete the book after Craig's passing in 2006. Steve Schott works as a bibliographic assistant at a large academic library in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Steve has been a classic horror fan since childhood. His favorite of the mid-century horror magazines is Castle of Frankenstein. As a teenager, Steve had articles published in such zines as Gary Svila's Gore Creatures and Midnight Marquee. In the 1990s, Steve, a Dark Shadows fan since 1968, was published in World of Dark Shadows and subsequently Stuart Manning's Dark Shadows Journal. Recent publications have included film reviews in the British publication Unsung Horrors and a short memoir for Kurt Ladnier's excellent Strange Paradise blog, Mal Jardin. Steve cordially disagrees with Roger Collins' assertion that tea is not a liquid. Um, and <laughs> welcome to the show, both of you. It's a pleasure having <laughs> you both here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we are here to celebrate one of Dark Shadow's greatest actors on the show, Grayson Woo! Hall. Yes. And uh, lo a long overdue Grayson Hall celebration here. Uh, and um, Grayson, of course, first appeared on Dark Shadows as Dr. Julia Hoffman in episode 265 on June 30th, 1967, uh, about two and a half months after Barnabas first showed up on the scene. And uh, the introduction of this iconic character was pivotal to the show as Julia went on to play a major role in the series. Uh, in fact, Grayson ended up uh, portraying, portraying a total of six characters on Dark Shadows, uh, Dr. Dr. Julia Hoffman, Countess Natalie Dupre, Magda Rokosi, Hoffman, the housekeeper, Julia Collins, and Constance Collins. And in addition, she, of course, went on to play a version of Dr. Julia Hoffman in House of Dark Shadows and played Carlotta Drake in Night of Dark Shadows. So an iconic actress, not only in Dark Shadows, but just in general, uh, Grayson Hall is certainly a beloved uh, figure uh, in a Dark Shadows fandom and just among film buffs and uh, theater goers. So uh, I'd like to, to talk to both of you about Grayson today. Uh, and I'd like to start with RJ. Uh, how did you get into Dark Shadows and what inspired you to write this sensational <laughs> book about Grayson Hall? Um, well, I wish I could make this a short uh, story, but uh, the fact that she was, and Steve has heard bits of this, and I'm going to try to tie it all together today. She intermittently popped up in my life since my birth. So my mother was a very big Dark Shadows fan and watched it when I was born in September 1967. And um, my mother watched it while I was in vitro and then afterwards and uh, she told me many years later when she caught me watching it when I was in high school, uh, when I was about 13, it was playing on the PBS local channel. And I was just intrigued by this weird TV show I stumbled on, you know, on a crazy summer afternoon. And it was, 
I, I grew up in Kansas and it was really hot and humid. So I, I didn't go outside to enjoy the summer. I stayed indoors with the air conditioning. And uh, my mother came home from work and she's like, um, what are you watching? And I'm like, I don't know, some weird TV show about vampires. And this really cool lady is on here. And uh, she just, you know, she's just really interesting. And my mom said, oh, Dark Shadows. I really enjoyed that when you were a baby, I used to watch it. She was a big Angelique fan. Uh, but she said, but that lady, whenever you fussed as a baby and that woman started speaking, you would stop fussing. So <laughs> apparently it goes back to like yet what less than one. Wow. And so it was on a little bit uh, that summer and I watched it and then I had to go back to school and I, I forgot about it. Many years later, you know, 10, 15 years later, I'm living in the Bay Area and um, my boyfriend has gotten one of the new high speed internet cable and um, he has 500 channels and I'm at his uh, house uh, for a couple of days during the week because I'm sick and I'm trying to entertain myself and there's 500 um, channels of cable and I can find nothing except ooh, on the sci fi channels this kooky old show that I watched for a little bit, you know. And uh, I just started watching it and with, he had a high speed internet. So I went online and started um, doing internet searches. And I came across the dark shadows, web ring, wing, ring, ring. <laughs> and, uh, and Darren Gross's page about restoration, about night of dark shadows. And, and they were searching for someone to be, um, to do uh, Grayson's voice. And I was like, I happen to know an actor uh, you may remember the name, uh, Danielle, uh, Matthew Martin. He did a lot of uh, theater here in San Francisco. He's a male actor. He's not a drag artist. He's an actor, but he does play a lot of female characters. And his natural voice sounded somewhat similar to hers. And so I called him and said, hey, 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 do you know who this person is? And I left it on his um, voicemail. He called me back, honey, honey, I've been in love with her since I was 12. Find out for me, find out for me. And so I did, I followed up with Darren and emailed him. We got to talking, my friend Matthew auditioned um, and uh, Dar my, Matthew asked me to stay in touch with Dark Shadows. What's going on? I wanna know. And I, was, I said, okay. So I, I just, you know, sat in and started recording it every day. And that lady, she just took over my life. <laughs> 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 All my fantasy life and then eventually you know, um, I moved to New York and um, I know Steve had been interested in writing about her for a while. And I read a couple of pieces he'd done for a couple of websites and some other things. Um, and I was in New York and I said, take advantage of me. I'm here. I'll go do research for you at the Billy Rose Theater Collection. I'll look for people to talk to, you know. And, um, and so I did a bit of that. And then finally, Steve was like, Ugh, I'm interested in other things. I don't want to paraphrase Steve, but I, this is my recollection. You can correct the record. <laughs> you know, why, why don't you do it? And I was like, oh, I really wanted to, but I thought that was greedy and I, I didn't want to do it. So I was like, no, 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 Steve, this is your, you want to do this. And so I waited for another year until Steve said, I'm not going to do it. Why don't you do it? And I was like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> 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 Send me everything you got. I'm ready. <laughs> and um, I happened to live by the Billy Rose Theater Collection. I was living behind Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. And so Steve sent me the clippings and collection stuff he had. And I just, that it just called to me. Like I always like red haired unmarried ladies and films and books. And it's just, it's just a weird thing I do. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then I love the theater. Even when I was in high school I lived in this small Kansas town and I'd walk the back stacks where no one else went and I'd grab the theater books and I'd read what were the best the best of plays every year that came out mm -hmm. I would read and I would look for certain people her name was was in there that I would look for and, and other actresses and and so it just called to all the things that I love which was research I studied history in college and uh and I like tying together the people how they knew each other actors how they'd work together and certainly you know you guys both know when you start diving into dark shadows you find that they all knew each other through all these little things yeah. all these little things and so that's how I got involved and invested and um, obsessed 
Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> well, it, it was, you know, when I read the book, when I first read it, it just, it's so inspiring. Like it made me want to just run off to New York and do like avant-garde underground theater. It, <laughs> yes. just, it was just such a right. great, great read. Um, and for, for fans who, who don't have it, you should absolutely uh, get your hands on uh, Grayson Hall, a hard act to follow because I have it right here. It's Yay. wonderful. Um, so Steve, how about you? Of course, we, we've, um, we've uh, interacted quite a bit over the years on the Dark Shadows forums back, uh, back in the day and uh, ran, you know, hung out a couple of times. And uh, I know you've been a longtime fan of, um, of Grayson Hall and also of Dark Shadows and just all things gothic. In fact, that's uh, the name you go by, uh, as I recall. So t- talk to us about how you got into Dark Shadows in the first place. And also, what is it about Grayson? and all that that resonates with you well i just have to share a fanboy moment i know that most of your <laughs> guests don't do this but i'm just so honored to be on your show because oh. i thought your act was just i loved your act to the um penny dreadful oh thank you all the stuff <laughs> that i've seen of you um your film shows and everything um like i love your vimeo channel that you set up Oh, thanks. And uh, it was really <laughs> sweet to be able to meet you and Magoo years ago in Salem uh, <laughs> that time and give you uh, uh, one of my videotapes of Strange Paradise. Yes, I, I still it. have it. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of it's on uh, YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Now. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, just, you know, I just love, and I love what you've been doing with Terror at Collinwood. I just think it's really innovative and um, presenting Dark Shadows in a way, you know, it's very creative and the guests you've had on have been really cool. And even like when you had Mark Perry on, I thought, I don't know about this project, but your interview with him was utterly fascinating. I listened to the entire thing and he has some great ideas. for. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, so I got into Dark Shadows. I really remember it very clearly. Um, I remember the first episode that I saw. It was in June of 1968. And I was still nine years old. I turned 10, like about a month later after I started watching. And uh, my babysitter got me into it. I think that might have been the last summer that my sister and I had a babysitter. Because I think after then, you know, in the 60s, people weren't as... Um, as uh, determined. Neurotic. <laughs> their little darlings were supervised at every moment of the day. But, but we were still young enough that our babysitter, her name was Judy, and um, she started talking about this TV show. She probably figured out that if there was any book about witches or ghosts or vampires in the library, I had to check it out and I had to read it. And she said, well, you know, there's a vampire on TV now. And I said, really? And people just don't understand. In the 60s, there really was very little, you know, like there was like the Adams Family and the Munsters. And then on the weekends, there was Creature Feature mm-hmm. or what, what have you. Right. But there was really just very little. I really it was very, very little. straight. Everything was very straight. Mm-hmm. Everything, like, yeah, the straight yeah. world was definitely in control, even though the counterculture, which terrified mm-hmm. um, a lot of the, the, when we said straights in the 60s, it didn't just mm-hmm. mean heterosexuals, it meant, no, like, it was just like, the man, like, land culture, the man, like, yeah, and, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, the corporations, and, yeah, yeah. and now it's more insidious, because they pose as being countercultural, but right, that's another topic for another time, okay. um, but yeah, it was just like, so she, she talked about it. And then the most amazing thing that I still remember is she drew a picture of Angelique on um, this little blackboard. We had one of those tiny little blackboards in the basement. And she said, look at her. She's so pretty, but you would never know. She's so evil. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You know, like, cause I loved witches and I loved vampires. Mm-hmm. So the first episode that I saw actually featured Thayer David, who we were talking about briefly before we began recording. And he was like my first, the first person who intrigued me. You know, there was kind of a dull episode. Um, I think it might have been the death of Sam Evans, actually, but okay. I don't know. I remember a lot of it was in the hospital. And uh, I thought, well, Thayer David's intriguing. 
Of course, I didn't know his name at the time. So I'm going to keep watching. The next day was the exorcism of Cassandra Collins by oh. Reverend Trask. Oh, great. <laughs> And I mean, watching something like that, like it started out with her casting a spell on uh, poor Elizabeth Collins Stoddard, who looked just like Naomi Collins, who had always been very nice to Angelou, not that mm -hmm. I knew that. And then behind her, the ghost of Reverend Trask begins to materialize. And I was just like transfixed. And then when he did the big like ritual, like there was an occult ritual, on TV in the afternoon when none of my parents were home. <laughs> they had no idea what I was watching. <laughs> I just adored it. And then the next day, which was a Monday, I saw my first sight of Julia and Barnabas. And they both had that air of Gothic intrigue. And um, what, at the beginning of my notes for today, I wrote, theatricality is the keynote because for, I've realized this over time, like so many people write on Dark Shadows um, fan groups on Facebook. Oh, if only Dark Shadows were done today, they could like make the special effects really super and it would look so great. Well, I didn't really care about the special effects. In fact, the special effects on Dark Shadows were really pioneering, especially- At the time, yeah. Yes, oh yeah. It was amazing what they, and they didn't just keep it in one place, like each year or every few months, they kept introducing. And like a lot of people who talk about the series don't acknowledge, they did video editing um, mm -hmm. as well, yeah. starting in the fall of 69, I think yeah. it was. Yeah. And then they used that a lot, of course, during the parallel time mm -hmm. storyline. Um, but um uh, for me, what made Dark Shadows, what continues to make Dark Shadows fascinating is the theatricality. Yeah. And I realized like if I had been wealthier and if I had lived in a different city and had a different kind of situation, I probably would have become a huge theater buff and just mm -hmm. gone to plays mm -hmm. a lot. And um, that's what I really love about, I think, um, I'm not actually a huge fan of Danny Horn's um, blog, but I was, uh, for to prepare for today, I was reviewing various entries and he spoke about the Magda trial episode that I'd like to talk about later as mm -hmm. having an off-Broadway intensity. And for yeah. me, that sums up that phrase. Mm -hmm. Why, mm -hmm. you know, like periodically I, I'll go back to Dark Shadows having not watched it for quite some time. And I'll think, am I really going to enjoy this? And it just captures me because of that magic that yeah. feeling that they're flying by the seat of their pants they don't know from moment to moment is like the set going to fall over or whatever <laughs> and they just <laughs> enjoy because that's what theater actors do the show yeah. must mm -hmm. go on and they're not mm -hmm. like the Hollywood actors where they're constantly turning to the director to say what's my motivation they're right. just like doing it baby yeah know? right and the spontaneity, I, I think, added to the uh, that frenetic energy that was it was coming through, uh, because they they had to to bring that uh, energy every single day to to the studio, uh, and it was it was I mean, like you said, flying by the seat of their pants, but it it actually added to it, uh, and um, the theatricality of the actors, they brought in all these amazing, I mean, these eccentric, unique, larger than life people who to, to play these roles, uh, not only Grace and as you mentioned, you know, Jonathan and, and Thayer David and, um, and even, and even some of the, the, uh, younger actors as well, like, uh, John Carlin. I mean, just, there was a certain, quality to them that you really don't see very much these days i mean that that type of you know, gravitas, intensity intensity and intensity. gravitas and and right. yeah mm -hmm. i love george disenzo said about grayson that she was a wackadoodle and overly dramatic um even putting on her shoes was an <laughs> awful area um so you know it's just like that personality that was so really almost too large for our little tv screens but um mm -hmm. That, that just captures you, that they're so invested in it. They're like, they're taking it for real. They're going to bring it home, mm -hmm. you know. 
So they, they, they took it all very seriously. Although they probably, they were, behind, you know, the ones camera was cut, they were laughing their asses. Off oh, of course. Show. And that, that's, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And that's, it, they weren't, yeah, they definitely, every, and, and I always, it all, I always roll my eyes and when right. I see people, like, oh, dark shadows, tongue in cheek or campy. And right. it's like, well, no, they were, they were actually, th these actors were playing this right. as if these events were really transpiring, you know, this, this right. was happening and the larger than life theatricality, it, it, it fits, it falls right into place in terms of the Gothic right. uh, genre. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the heightened emotion of, of the gothic genre, that, that's what it's about. You have that right. sort of larger than life, um, almost exaggerated, not to the point of uh, absurdity or tongue in cheek. It's not like the, the 66 Batman where it is. Yeah, there right. are, there are, there's some tongue in cheek happening there. I think they were genuinely, uh, and everybody interviewed for the show too, maintains that as well. So um, what about, what about, now, what is it? about Grayson Hall in particular that uh, is it is it the theatricality or uh, just her uh, delivery what what is what is it about because Steve as you outlined in your notes you know uh, the way Grace even just Julia herself I mean Julia is such an iconic part of dark shadows uh, you can't have dark shadows I think without Dr. Julia Hoffman once she shows up the show, pivots in a, in a really unique and interesting direction, you know, as she's uncomfortable, she's, she is a match for Barnabas. Um, and it's interesting how her character evolves throughout the course of, of the series. You kind of outlined this a little bit, uh, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. Well, um, I wrote some um, phrases <clears throat> about the different roles that Julia played. Um, mm -hmm. I think the 1967 version of Julia was kind of different from what she became after the mm -hmm. 1795 flashback, which of course happened with Barnabas mm -hmm. as well. But because both Grayson and Jonathan Frid were such skilled actors and um, I, I don't think they really hung on to the story, but they hung on to their characterizations. And so with those changes, they made it very plausible because of the kind of humanity that they brought. And I absolutely love your uh, point about this kind of emotional, um, dramatic plane as being integral to the Gothic aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been great to see that coming back into horror, I think primarily through the lens of the folk horror Mm -hmm. revival because that's kind of brought back a lot of this um, gothic stuff but I, so I wrote down these phrases Dr. Julia Hoffman psychiatrist and blood specialist Dr. Julia Hoffman occult investigator occult detective Dr. Julia Hoffman mad scientist Dr. Julia Hoffman Colin Wood's very own Dr. Feelgood <laughs> I mean on the Dark Shadows wiki there's actually a hashtag for sedative whatever one is dispensed. <laughs> Dr. Julia Hoffman, master hypnotist and mesmerist. Dr. Julia Hoffman, den mother or simply the mom. And it's interesting how, in how many episodes Julia basically fulfills the role of the mom. I mean, there's one where um, they're in the lab with poor Dr. Lang and Barnabas. And one is Dr. Lane's over here and Barnabas is over there and they're both going, Julia, Julia. And she's like, Were you two mad priests trying to hold it together? <laughs> and they're like li these little things like she'll um, adjust David's hair, just brush it or she'll fix Chris Jennings coat buttons. And you're like, well, she's this really cool lady but she's also a mom. And I think um, RJ in your book, you uh, wrote very, with great insight about that kind of um, dichotomy in Grayson's character, how she was very flamboyant and mm -hmm. out there, but she also was a mom and she loved yeah. being a cook. And uh, I, I remember, remember one scene where she's with um, Denise Richardson and the camera's on Denise Richardson, but you could see Grayson stroking her hair in it. And again, I was like, a uh, very motherly thing to do. And I, to follow on, Steve, um, 
I think Grayson and Sam, when he joined the show after Grayson, Grayson helped him get the job. Just let's yep. be clear. There's yep. a lot of rumors out there about he got her the job. No, it was the other way around. Um, he wrote for her to be a sympathetic par- character. He said she could never show that in her other film work or TV work. I would kind of um, differ because I feel like in Night of the Iguana, for which she was nominated for an Academy Award, um, uh, Judith, Fel- Judith Fellows and Grayson, they both... Ha- they were in or, or Julia Hoffman and Judas Fellows. They were both in love with somebody and they couldn't speak of it. They couldn't do anything about it. And I thought that both of the characters were very vulnerable and they're see, they're supposed to be the antagonist, but in both instances, they, that you gain sympathy. I leave that of the iguana feeling very sympathetic for Judith Fellows. If I was a 40 ish year old woman with dysentery in Mexico, trying to keep track of this little nymphette, who's being eyeballed by a drunken ex-minister, I think I would have had it up to here as well myself, you know? Yeah. And so I feel that Grayson is very good about painting this sympathy and that there's this uh, yearning and longing in these women. And I think that's what I responded to. You know, I responded to Julia was a professional woman, sort of um, discounted uh, by, by men, you know, the men who she always had to help, as Steve pointed out. Also by a lot of fans, she's discounted as a romantic lead. Um, oh, Barnabas should have always been with Angelique, never with Julia. That ticks me off to no end, <laughs> you know? And so I think that's what I respond to is this woman constantly being discounted, who is an equal, who is superior, and who is taking care of business for everybody because they're all fruiting out about everything happening and can't get their stuff together, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I think, we tend to a lot of times focus on well, Barnabas, Quentin, and Angelique because they're the supernatural characters. Mm-hmm. And Julia right. isn't supernatural, but she can always hold her own. Against, she, she can stand mm-hmm. uh, face-to-face with supernatural beings like Barnabas, right. like Nicholas Blair, like Angelique uh, slash Cassandra, um, yeah. Count Potofi. I mean, she's just... Uh, you she's, bought it, too. You bought it. This yeah. lady's standing up in her little plaid, you know, suit, and she's not going to take anybody's business. Right. right. And because she, I mean, she's brilliant. She's very deceptive too, mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. she's, she's, she, she's uh, very, uh, she's very uh, clever. She's very intelligent. You know, she yes. can, uh, and it's, it's great to see her match wits with Barnabas, especially in those, where she's, those episodes those are where she's uncovering. You know, those, right after he's, 1795. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, wh- uh, now, uh, RJ, you, you know, you, you write a lot in your book, of course, we don't, we don't want, we're talking about uh, Grayson's Dark Shadows portrayals, but she was, uh, you know, she did so much outside of Dark Shadows. And you mentioned Night of yeah. the Iguana, which is an amazing Tennessee Williams play. I was in Night of the Iguana. Actually, I played uh, the Deborah Kerr role. I played Hannah. Oh, yeah. Hannah Jell, I thought they'd want me to play Maxine, actually, when I, when I went and audition, right. but they wanted me for Roman Coco. Roman Coco. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I had Nano, I was pushing Nano around. Oh, right. Um, so, um, but uh, she did so much in, 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 in the theater. What, what are some of her favorite roles, do you know, uh, or things that she, what was her? She, yeah, you know? she really enjoyed uh, that. She did three Jean Genet plays, uh, The Balcony, La Balcon. Uh, in 1960 with Sylvia Miles. Nancy Marchand originated the part that she ended up taking over because uh, Nancy Marchand was pregnant. So she took over uh, the, um, the madam of the, the, uh, the bordello. So this ran off Broadway, Broadway for over a year. And this was a straight play to run for over a year um, downtown in the village it was really kind of unheard of. And um, so that was one of her favorites. And that's the first time she used the stage name Grayson Hall. She had been Shirley Grayson before, mm-hmm. and it was by an accident that um, the script was delivered because they only knew her as, hey, she's mar- who's what's that actress's name? She's married to Sam Hall. We want to give her this part. Uh, I don't know. He calls her Grayson. So I guess her name's Grayson Hall. And so they delivered the script to her as Grayson Hall. You know, professionally, she had been Shirley Grayson. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but she liked it and she went with it. And um, so that was, I think, a big uh, 
marking point in her career. Her Broadway debut was in a musical called Subways Are For Sleeping with Carol Lawrence, uh, better known as the original, um, uh, what am I trying to say, Steve? Um, just made a mu uh, West, West Side Story. She was the original Maria. Um, but Grayson didn't sing in it and she didn't really do much in the part. She was in the first act and that was it. Uh, so she, so that's her Broadway debut. And she did a lot of other plays, um, but that they were small, they didn't last long. You know, she did a lot of stuff out of town, which I've not tracked down, uh, but a few pieces of it. Um, she also did another, um, Benet, uh, Jean Genet play, um, right after Dark Shadows where she played again, uh, uh, Vorda, the, you know, the head of the prostitutes. And then she was in Happy End, which was a big play. Christopher Lloyd was in it, Meryl Streep. And she did sing on Broadway with that. And uh, her neighbor who happened to be married to the theater director for Circle in the Square, Ted Mann, was her vocal co coach. And there's a, there's a cassette tapes of her. Now it's theatrical singing, so she's, she's She's doing a recitative, which is telling you the story. You know, she's not doing an aria. Mm -hmm. um, so the those are big. The lady in hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> so I think some of those are her big um, theatrical pieces. She really liked doing the House of Blue Leaves as well with John Lagar. She did not end up getting that on Broadway. She did it out of town. That actually turned out to be a real formative summer that they did it up in Rhode Island while he was still creating the play and drafting it her son Matthew was with her mm -hmm. um, but she did not get the part on Broadway and there was hard feelings after that between her and the author so I see mm -hmm. but if you read Matthew Hall's blog which I think you're going to link to in your show notes he yes. talks about that very formative summer it's called Nantucket 73 and that was the summer mm -hmm. um, and then her last play was uh, the Mad Woman of Shao um, she didn't actually get to go on with that she did rehearsals and that was with Geraldine Page Carrie Nye um, um, oh, Mother Superior, Madeline Sherwood. Mm -hmm. That was her last, um, her last play, and she had to leave before it actually opened because of the she was so ill. Oh, no, she did several uh films, she appeared in several films as well. Um, uh, I haven't seen them all, I've seen you know, right. that darn cat and uh, gargoyles right. and some, some of those, right. but um, right, uh, she did a film with Michael Douglas early in his career. They filmed that in Missouri, and um, um, all of her other film pieces are, are small, except for Night of the Iguana, and then mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, well, and then there's the film that we are not supposed to mention, oh, right? She's the no, she claimed oh, yeah. she wasn't in, <laughs> yeah. she's Thank excellent you. in that. I actually really high, highly recommend people watch that. She's great in that. Is it Pepe. Polly Magoo? Or was it? No, um, it's Satan in High Heels. Satan in High Heels, that's right. Satan in High Heels. So, well, yeah. Polly Magoo, um, that's sort of a weird French film. Um, she lived in Gore Vidal's apartment in Paris while she made that. Wow. Um, Grayson was very connected. People will say, if you wanted to go to any play or go to any restaurant, you would call her and she'd get you in. Mm -hmm. Grayson and Sam were very connected, new people everywhere. You know, er, um, uh, Armit Erdogan, who was the direct uh, music director uh, of, of uh, not, not Capitol, which was not Capitol Records. Yeah. He was on their honeymoon. Uh, they got drunk. He ended up going on their honeymoon with them with a girlfriend who was Grayson's uh, roommate. It was all very strange story. It's in the book. <laughs> but so so they were very connected and she did go to Paris and did made a film in Paris. Mm -hmm. And she did do a couple of plays in Italy at the Spoleto uh, Festival. Yeah. So she got around. Um, <laughs> when when I met Meryl Streep, Meryl Streep asked me, why do you want to write a book about Grayson? And I, I fumbled. I didn't have my pitch ready, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I said, she had a, a modicum of success in every genre. Um, she had the Oscar nomination. She was big in avant-garde theater and, 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 and Southern Manhattan. She had Broadway experience. Uh, and then she was in the, uh, this iconic actress on a, you know, gothic TV show that has reached, you know, um, iconic status and she's mostly remembered for that even her mother said you'll be remembered more for this than for anything else you've done um but that's why i i love her uh, she just had all these pieces all this this incredibly faceted personality and then like steve pointed out I, in the book i'm like you know people think she was at home there was a 
uh, PBS, uh, NPR, uh, This American Life, actually that there were two episodes about dark shadows and one of the people were talking about how they love to think about her, you know, sitting in Manhattan, smoking and drinking in a bar, you know, around <laughs> the, the, the theater, uh, corner from the theater. And, and I remember uh, Catherine Lee Scott said, <laughs> did little did they know she was at home making cookies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the mom the, side the, of her personality yeah. was the dichotomy. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and I remember reading, I think it was one of those interviews that, uh, that Catherine Lee Scott did with uh, David Hennessy. He remarked on something that she was, had a sort of co would comment on things like kind of like a mom would, you mm -hmm. know, um, yeah. uh, she, um, she, uh, I read about to the, the dinner parties that uh, mm -hmm. she'd have with Sam at their, at their house and Dark Shadows cast right. members would go to their apartment and she had a, they had a very unique looking apartment i mean there's yeah like, they're... well it was dark and so they they said we're gonna go with it and they painted the walls wet walls red and they had you know all sorts of uh, antiques and you know as a person a gal who lived in new york who could barely afford a room you know uh. <laughs> in a closet yeah. i very much envied that apartment i was all like can't you guys let me move in now yeah that room's empty you know so but mm. you know matthew and his wife were always gracious and would have me over for meals and thanksgivings and and, um, and, and uh, Matthew, they had two small children at the time. And so there were toys everywhere in a mess and Sam would come around and be like, oh, the money I spent decorating this place. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> male form, you know? <laughs> I wish that she had um, much like Thera David, I, Grayson, I lived long enough I, to see the Dark Shadows fandom sort of start to blossom for sure in mm -hmm. terms of like post uh, original airing as the festivals mm -hmm. began and uh, the uh, the syndicated episodes and things like that. Uh, uh, Thayer never got to attend and, and but Grayson never attended right. any of these yep. uh, festivals either and I, I I think she would have she would have enjoyed that uh, I think even Jonathan Fritt mm -hmm. I think when Mary O'Leary was yeah. on here she remarked on that yeah somebody yeah. asked a question at one of the latter fests or something I saw where they said who would have and they all, all the all the actors on the end end of the fest panel said oh Grayson would have loved these yeah yeah she would have really thrived so it mm -hmm. is it is unfortunate that she couldn't participate. Yeah, so. yeah, and she the the um, uh, Dan Curtis also. Uh, Steve and I were were messaging a little bit too earlier today. Dan Curtis loved Grayson Hall too. He mm -hmm. he really. Uh, in fact, at one point, Sam Hall was going to, suggested killing Julia off yeah. in order to yeah. kind of refresh the show. The show. Uh, yeah, and Dan right. said no way. I uh, he, he wouldn't. Well, let you that happen. you probably read early in the show there was a strike. Grayson came from a very, very, what today would be called progressive socialist family. Mm -hmm. You know, they had fled Russia uh, in the early 1900s, that Moldova, Ukraine, Russia was all that area. And they came and they were very big. You know, they had Eugene Debs on their mantle and they, uh, want, they actually sheltered Emma Goldman for a while. You know, they were very, very socialist minded. And so when this um, strike happened and it was threatened to shut down the whole show and it wasn't an actor strike, it was on the technical side, but still everybody supported them. All unions mm -hmm. would strike in solidarity, wouldn't cross the picket lines. Um, you know, Grayson and Sam almost had to move back to <clears throat> his hometown in Ohio because they were not getting work when she got this job. And, um, and so she put aside her sentiments and talked the rest of the actors into crossing the picket line mm -hmm. and saving the show. Um, so I think Dan was very loyal to her because of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Steve, you put together a, a list of, you know, your favorite, some of your favorite uh, Grayson Hall uh, scenes from all of the different characters. Of course, her favorite character was, was Magda, which I, we're going to talk about Magda in a little mm -hmm. bit. So, so take us through some of these uh, scenes and why you decided to choose those in particular, if you, if you would. Okay, well, I thought I would start by going through her characters. So I talked a little bit about Julia. Mm -hmm. And as part of my prep, I checked her, the episode numbers, like how many episodes was each character in and I was surprised. So Julia was in 341 of the total um, episodes. I guess the total is like 1225 yeah. of mm -hmm. the episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and just the, that number, that's 
one of the reasons why when people remember Grayson, they remember Julia. In fact, when I first got into the fandom, I was corresponding with the editor of a Grayson-centered zine called Wincliffe Watch. Oh, I remember May edit- Sutherland, yeah. Yes, and the yeah. editor said, oh, are you a Julia fan? <laughs> and I actually thought of myself as a Grayson Hall fan, mm-hmm. but I was like, well, yeah, I think Julia's great. And it's kind of interesting to see fans who don't like Grayson or don't like Julia. Like I, I saw a thread about this, I think on a Facebook group recently, or maybe it was actually a, a YouTube uh, commentary channel where they were like, oh, I hate Julia. She lied about everything. She covered up for Barnabas, <laughs> killed Dave. And they all a, lied. <laughs> <laughs> when, when there was um, there was a fan gathering just for Grayson and her fans in uh, 1982, the Grayson gathering, and it was a little bit sad because the person who put it together was unable to attend because uh-huh. of a family emergency. But there's a recording of them having dinner with Grayson, and at one point, somebody goes, "Well, uh, Grayson, you did kill your friend, Dr. Woodard." And Grayson says. I made a hypo. <laughs> <laughs> I did not, did not kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, remember, Barnabas threatened to torture Dave Woodard to death. I mean, he was heavily implying that he was not implying. He flat out said he was going to give, make his death horrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and agonizing. I mean, he. Uh, it, was there another way out of way that? to go? Yeah. Well, it, could she? What could she, else could she have? done at that i guess she could have gone to the police but i don't know i I, they wouldn't get we're gonna believe her oh there's a vampire out of collinwood sheriff (laughs) patterson was was, (laughs) sheriff patterson would have bungled that for sure (laughs) well as as mrs johnson said of sheriff patterson she knows he knows when the lunch whistle blows yes Another of my favorite actresses, Clarice Blackburn. Oh, she was great. She was, who was great. a good friend of Grayson's and she doesn't get enough um, recognition. Oh, agreed. Yeah. She was a, she was a great actress. Uh, you know, really, really fantastic. And Dana Elkar, actually, when we talk about Sher- Sheriff Patterson, Sheriff I, Pat- I haven't really talked about him a whole lot in the show, but he was he was out of the Sheriff Patterson's. He is the I would say the archetypal uh, Sheriff Patterson <laughs> on the show, the different actors who played that role. He, he was he was quite good and went on to success with MacGyver, as, as I recall. Um, yeah. So Julia went through uh, several different phases. And of course, Grayson uh, says that she's the one who came up with the idea that uh, Julia was in love, in love with mm-hmm. Barnabas, that Julia developed uh, feelings for Barnabas because at first she starts out, you know, very much of the, you know, mad scientist, science. the science she, mind. Yeah, he wants to. She's discovered this creature and feels that she can can cure him. And uh, but she develops feelings for him. And Grayson herself, she she came up with the idea of playing this angle, right? That that mm-hmm. uh, yeah, isn't that? Well, she right? she said she, that she found Grayson. She thought Julia was a straight ass. She was a straight <laughs> arrow. She was boring. <laughs> so she had she you know most actors who she took every class she studied the method she studied everything so she wrote her own background for julia in her own head and sure. gave her motivations and that's that's what she did that just she said to make her more interesting and then and the audience and connected up on it, it. for yeah. sure for sure the writers were like what's she do oh you know <laughs> yeah yeah and at, at first you know you're watching it and it's like wow, that's really messed up. Like at first, because he's just, he's a, he's a vampire. He is an undead creature who prays. So you really want to know what (laughs) was going on in Julia's home life as a child. Yes. Yes. And many and, fans, including myself, have tried to solve that. But yeah, not. but as the show goes on, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's fascinating. And they develop this bond and you feel for Julia. It's this unrequited yeah. love, you know, that she yeah. has for, for Barnabas. And I know a lot of, there's a lot of debate, like, well, was Barn- should Barnabas should be with Julia or Barnabas should be with Josette or Angelique. Yeah. I, I do, uh, you commented on Danny Horn, something he said that I agree. It's like, why should, does Barnabas, should Barnabas be with anybody <laughs> Right. Just, I mean, he's just Julia. Julia deserves better, doesn't she? I mean, I, right. I love Barnabas. Don't get me wrong. I love Barnabas, but right. he is a hot mess. <laughs> right. Right. She shouldn't have to be cleaning up with that for the rest of her days. Right? 
he's just I think that's part of what I like about Barbie. He's just so he is so there's so many different uh, you know conflicting yeah. personality right. traits and there's so he's a tortured soul you know right. um so uh let's talk about some of these scenes steve that you that you picked out what what what, what do you like about these scenes in particular okay um well one scene that i really love is in episode 296 when um julia has just hypnotized maggie evans and erased mm-hmm. her memory Mm-hmm. And sadly, it's an episode that exists only in Kinescope, which to me gives it an extra charm because it reminds me of a classic universal horror movie watching Same. it. Yeah. And Julia marches back into the old house and she coolly lights her cigarette from one of Barnabas's candles. <laughs> I love and, like, that. Yes. Flares at yeah. her. And she's like totally like what the hell, you know, I just <laughs> saved your vampire ass again. And then she informs him, I fixed this for you. She's not going to remember. And he's like, well, what if she does? And she's like, I will take care of it. But I am in control. Right. Good yeah. night, Barnabas. <laughs> <laughs> he marches out. <laughs> he's like, fit to be tied because he's this person from the 18th century yeah and women aren't supposed to behave like that now this was in 1967 Mm -hmm. and people who are younger don't realize that that was actually still the norm true you know Mm -hmm. with all the counterculture in the 1960s the 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 man as we were calling it they were all deeply threatened by feminism and betty for dad had written the feminine mystique and um I just love that scene because she kind of plays it like Natasha on uh, <laughs> Bullwinkle. <laughs> you but, have to wonder if that that cigarette lighting was in the stage direction or she just decided to do it, you know. All right. That's, that's such a boss move. It really is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, in a lot of the scenes, Grayson is like, like she was clinging to whatever thing is around, like a newel post or the bed post or whatever mm-hmm. and I I know watching it oh it's because she's jonesing for a cigarette and That's right and her gloves <laughs> RJ's are, ringing the gloves right now these <laughs> actually are Grayson Hall's gloves Danielle are oh you kidding God. me wow yeah oh awesome. that's awesome and this behind me they're red see on my left shoulder is a yeah. scarf uh, that she bought in Greece no and uh, Matthew gave these things to me so, but yeah, wow. Steve's right. She was Jones and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so oh, and this, this was hers as well. This brooch. Really? She bought this in Greece. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's so cool. You know, a fan commented the other day uh, on some, one of, one of the episodes that Grayson was, was the master of glove, bringing the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> I actually found the note where I where, with, with these and Matthew was saying I hope that, that my mother's hands were very small now as I remember I hope they can you can fit these and I'm like I'll find a way I'll find a way <laughs> uh, what about what about when Julia is uh, you, I, one thing you, you one of, in your notes are, you mentioned the, the hypnotism you know the, the she oh, hypnotizes yes. Vicky and I love that too where she's sort of uh, she's just uses uh, her skills as a hypnotist to implant that image of Barnabas, the ghoulish looking image of Barnabas is, looks green, uh, you know, and with the lighting in the coffin uh, and Vicky's, uh, you know, unconscious memory. And I always wonder malpractice, why Malpractice, malpractice. Right, right. <laughs> I you wish, I wonder why they never made that. You will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they First would make- First do some harm. First do some harm, you know? <laughs> I wish they would make that one of my favorite touches in that scene that I think that's like the best there's several episodes where she does that it's uh, episode 347 and it was written by the fabulous Joe Caldwell oh yes he's one of my favorite Mm -hmm. writers for the show Mm -hmm. um one of my favorite touches that again I think it's just Grayson throwing it in is is Vicky's so horrified and she can't bear to look. And Julia's like, you will look again. And then she's like, uh, Vicky's like terrified and horrified. And then Grace and, or Julia goes to close the coffin and there's this sigh of like the sigh with the eye roll of like, oh, you poor little ingenue. What are we going to do with you? 
<laughs> you can't cut it. You see him in the coffin and you're like ready to faint. Well, get used to it, honey. I just <laughs> love that. It's great. Steve, Steve, do you remember who directed that episode? <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I did not write mm-hmm. that down. Mm-hmm. Oh, I I know because like I, I'm curious at the episodes you check. I feel that uh, and it's been remarked upon in other forums is Leela Swift always told everyone to act bigger and bigger. You know, and so Grayson will get criticized for being overly hammy over director. Well, she was a she was professional. She followed her boss's advice. She was told to get bigger and yeah. bigger. And so, the, who was the director that always used the term transish? Transish. Henry, oh. Henry Kaplan. Henry, Henry Kaplan. Henry. Yeah. I think her best episodes are directed by yeah. him because she's much more subtle mm-hmm. and um, and nuanced. Yeah. And um, so I'll, I'm just going to, as Steve talks about the scenes, I'm going to kind of peek. I've got my, my computer open to see yeah. who directed. Um, uh, Sam uh, Hall co- commented in one of those MPI interviews that uh, when they'd cut to Grayson's reaction shot that she was channeling Greta Garbo. <laughs> and <he> was, <laughs> yeah. no, was, don't ever end on her. Don't ever. Yeah. Don't right. Ever end right. On her. <laughs> I wish they had made that uh, medallion as a, I'm surprised they never sold that as a Dark I Shadows agree. piece of merchandise, yeah. that the Julia Hypnotism medallion. That's, that's, they made them all of these other things. It's like, we need yeah. that medallion. That would be a fun I want the medallion. Oh, yeah. that'd be great. That'd be a great I don't piece care of- about all that other stuff they sell. I want that medallion. <laughs> You'll be walking around hypnotizing, hypnotizing people you. at work. <laughs> you give me all your money. You yeah. give me <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 other episodes uh would you, did, did you note here so i also love the um storyline where where old barnabas i'm glad that you mentioned at the beginning that there are spoilers ahead yes uh, old barnabas um bites uh carolyn and makes her his vampire slave Mm -hmm. and nancy barrett just and i think nancy barrett also like i want to give a big shout out to her i've actually met her a few times at the festivals grayson always said nancy was the best actress on the Mm -hmm. show and grayson was very impressed by nancy's fluency in cockney like (laughs) grayson thought technically that was Mm-hmm. incredible but Nancy is also just such a um a re- she's like very real but also um can like do the gothic emoji mm-hmm. in a way that's very um plausible and so whenever she and Grace would work together it just had this again this this magic this theatrical magic between mm-hmm. them because they worked together really well um, but that see those scenes where um, Barnabas made Carolyn uh, taunt Dr. Hoffman, my favorite, and my friend Michael, uh, who's a longtime fan as well, loves this too. When uh, Carolyn has put the hypo and a couple of other goodies in Julia's bedroom, and she comes down and and Carolyn's on the phone, <laughs> setting up a date with uh, the Jerry Lacey character, mm-hmm. and. Um, and then Julia slams the phone down and Carolyn looks at her and says, please, Julia, it's almost dinner time and you haven't even dressed. If you want to live with us, you have to live by our <laughs> Yes, that's great. And yes. if looks could kill, the look that Julia gives her is like just brilliant. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Great choice, absolutely. I agree with you uh, and I agree with Grayson about Nancy uh, Barrett, Was she was, absolutely one of the best uh, actresses uh, on the show just or actors on the show period because she just she was so genuine every character even when mm-hmm. she was playing something like Pansy Fay um there right. was a lot of depth to that character you know in another actor's hands that could have just been uh, just this kind of a, just a stereotype crazy mm-hmm. cockney character but she was there was a a, a tragic aspect to that character as well and uh she she, she nancy barrett is is great she's sensational i agree yeah all right yeah so a lot of fans um really love the episode where barnabas comes to julia's bedroom and she tells him i've been waiting for you a long time a long yeah. long time a very long time <laughs> but actually more than that i love the scene immediately before that which also is a joe caldwell script mm-hmm. where the two are playing cat and mouse and she's like i've told you i'll give you a fair exchange of information well how much could you possibly know 
oh, I know more than you might think, you know, and she's just winding him up. Yeah. That scene is just so brilliantly played. Every time I watch it again, I'm like, yeah, go Julia. But, you know, it's kind of scary too, because he's right. a vampire. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Um, Joel Caldwell, I, 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 he's, he's still with us. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I believe he's, yeah, he's still with us. So yeah, he's the last surviving Dark Shadows writer, I believe. So I'd, I'd like to get him on the podcast at some point, because he wrote some absolutely wonderful episodes. And then he came back in parallel time and wrote some great episodes there too. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and then uh, we can't forget, of course, the vampire Tom Jennings storyline. Yes. <laughs> another actor that Grayson really um, worked well with was mm-hmm. the late Don Briscoe. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. The, he really enjoyed how, you know, her style of acting. And mm-hmm. um, there's this really cute scene in um, the Leviathan storyline where they're doing a dramatic scene and it's towards the end of the scene and the camera's on Don and all of a sudden he breaks out into this big grin and you know that it's because Grayson had just pulled one of her faces Aww. at him, which she would do periodically, even though as RJ says, she was always professional, but yeah. they had like really long working hours on Dark Shadows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, but fans, um, I guess the fandom is divided. Some fans think like the Tom thing is like, really scary and other fans interpret it as oh she was cheating on Barnabas with Tom even though of course she had nothing to do with the right. fact that he attacked her right yeah. um, but he played Briscoe played Tom in a very erotic way and then like the yeah. payoff ultimately is when Don Briscoe comes back as Chris Jennings the first time Julia sees him is when she's in yeah. Joe Haskell's hospital room mm-hmm. and she has to freak out <laughs> and then <laughs> tamp it down real quick because Joe don't, doesn't know what's going on yeah <laughs> yes and you can tell Don Briscoe's trying hard to like just like not crack up and try to <laughs> yeah. in that scene yeah you don't remember our one night stand honey come on yeah <laughs> I, I love I love the the whole uh, Tom Jennings uh, Julia stuff I, uh, that whole sequence with 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 Tom and uh, and uh, and Julia I think it's it was an interesting you know here's Julia who was trying to uh, re- you know reverse Barnabas's condition uh, and get rid of the vampire curse. Uh, and here now she's being victimized by a vampire and it's up to Barnabas to and who you know, not long before was planning to kill Julia is now has to save Julia from a vampire, which was an interesting, uh, you know, turn of events there for sure. Right. Uh, Yeah. Um, Another scene that fans love to play over and over and over again is what I call the slap heard around the world. Oh yeah. Everybody loves that one. (laughs) When that evil wig wearing witch, Cassandra (laughs) Collins, (laughs) needed to get her come up and yeah. Yeah. and um i i still remember when i was watching that episode in 1968 i was at my grandmother's house and i just can't convey to you what it was like to see something like that on tv you know i mean because nowadays the whole bitch thing and soap operas it's like a cliche but mm-hmm. well i never watched soap operas unlike a lot of dark shadows fans yeah, me neither i never got into regular soap operas <laughs> the only other one i ever watched was strange paradise which i'm still a fan of right I'm which is was episodes. sort of inspired by the success of dark shadows uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah um the slap r- heard around the world i mean that's uh, that's you know such a famous scene from from the show and again it goes mm-hmm. back to you know when i was talking about julia just is able to stand toe-to-toe with with these super i mean Cassandra is a powerful witch uh, and Julia I, that worked on so many levels uh, just okay. that it's just such a great moment in, in dark shadows. Uh, okay. And it's Julia's talk about a, a boss move. Definitely. Right. <laughs> For sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. 
And then following up on that, all the scenes where Julia defies um, Nicholas Blair, oh, played yeah. by another of the greatest actors on the show to yes. me, Humbert Allen Estrado. It's great. Who, um, I'm so glad that uh, somebody uh, with the Collinsport Historical Society did a, a video, an audio interview with Humbert before yeah. he died. It was Patrick McRae, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's a great interview and mm -hmm. fans of Humbert should listen to it. For Dark Shadows fans, he only talks about Dark Shadows during the last minute and a half, roughly. Mm -hmm. I don't think Humbert really wanted to talk about Dark Shadows. I think it was more, I asked Patrick about that. He was on episode 10 of the podcast. And I think it was more, he was, he assumed that uh, Humbert wouldn't want to talk about Dark Shadows and was scared a little to bring it up. And then he asked, is it okay if we talk about Dark Shadows? And Humbert said, sure. He was fine with it. Uh, so he said he wished he had talk, asked him a little bit more about it uh, because he seemed okay with it when he brought it up. But I think he started out by talking a lot about theater and he's, Patrick is a, is a theater teacher. He's very knowledgeable about the theater. So I think Humbert like that and felt comfortable talking with him. So, uh, but I'm glad he did at least get that bit about Dark Shadows in at the end, yeah. Yeah, because it was so fascinating to learn that the role of Nicholas was written specifically for Humbert. Yes, yeah. And uh, so Humbert and Grayson, I think, might have had a similar background in some ways. And again, as with Clarice Blackburn and some of the other actors that we've talked about, they just were so great together. Um, and it was, you know, as somebody watching at home, again, we were so unused to seeing these supernatural beings and to see somebody who was just human and for the love of Barnabas. But also it was kind of like, you felt like there was a limit to how patient Julia could be. Yeah. And I felt like that came out in her scenes with Nicholas because I'm sure in her mind she was thinking, can't you keep your own house in order? You know, you've got this pet vampire living with you and you have this glorious plan for the new master race, but don't you realize what's going on right under your very nose? And then you yeah. get the great scene where um, Nicholas chastises Angelique, which is also a big fan favorite, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that she, she just brings him the steak and the mallet. <laughs> <laughs> just hit, leaves them there yeah. you know you know what needs to be done and just yeah it's, it's great she says, she says you forget mr blair i am an authority on this disease yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> i always felt i mean julia the fact that Julia thought she could cure Barnabas is fascinating. And she, I don't think, I think uh, George DiCenzo wrote a letter to a fan saying that any cure for vampirism would not be permanent. It would, it would, he yeah. would revert at some point because it's a supernatural affliction, but Julia figured out how to, how to isolate these cells. And subsequently, I mean, Julia could do just about any sort of anything that involved mad science to, to call Julia. I mean, with, with Adam, with Eve, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, even uh, later on with um, Judah Zachary, the reattach, trying oh, to put the head. Uh, yes, <laughs> to, to, to reattach. The, they had these wires with the, the lightning and everything and that attached to the mask thing. of Baal. And, <laughs> oh, it was great. It was, it was, I wonder if, if they were inspired by, I mean, we know Dan Curtis was a fan of Universal Horror Films, and I wonder if he saw uh, House of Dracula, you know, be, with Dr. Edelman, uh, where Dracula, John Carradine's Dracula want, uh, mm -hmm. goes uh, to be cured, asks Dr. Edelman for, for a cure, which doesn't work out for, <laughs> for Dr. <laughs> Edelman. But um, I wonder if that was, that seed was in there somewhere. I just want to say um, one thing. I know like everybody always repeats the story that it was because of a typo that Dr. Julian Hoffman became Dr. Julia Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is just my opinion. I personally don't buy that story. There was an interview, I think it was um, Bob Costello, the uh, producer mm -hmm. for a while, uh, talked about when they were casting the role of Dr. Hoffman. I think he said in the, in the, they were in a bar and I think he said either Grayson was on TV Right. Or um, she might have actually shown up and they she might have joined them for drinks briefly. And after she left, somebody said, 
you know, she would be great as this doctor. Why don't we cast her? There are also rumors that um, another actress had been cast before her and didn't work out. That's what Catherine Lee Scott. Rebecca. Right. So yeah. my research showed that they did audition men, but they thought they were all boring. They didn't, they couldn't uh -huh. pick any of them. They thought they were boring. And they did select another woman and, um, Sam said he was going to try to remember her name because it was a, he said it was a name I would know, um, but he he never uh, got back to me about it because uh, it, she just decided she didn't want to do it, and so they called the casting agent Michael Shirtliff who got Grace in her role in A Night of the Iguana, and they called and said we need somebody fast. We're just, it's filming is tomorrow. This woman just backed out, and he said okay, well I've got somebody, and that's so. And then Grayson was. The story is, it was a hot summer day. She was about ready to step in the shower and she picked up the phone and they, he said, get over there right away. And of course, Grayson only lived seven blocks away from the studio. And so that's when she went over and then, yeah, she started the next day. Mm -hmm. so, Amazing. Yeah. Because they, um, they uh, I mean, Dr. Woodard refers to Julian Hoffman in, the, in yeah. the show itself. So yeah, maybe they were, I can see that they were, they auditioned some guys and they weren't happy with them and then changed yeah. changed the uh, gears and of course dan curtis claimed that he he was the one who said oh let's let's make the doctor a woman but right. you never know with dan right. <laughs> right. uh so okay so how about some grayson played several other characters in the show do you have any other yes. julia comments uh steve before talking about some of her other characters well, I'm going to move on to talk about um, another character who I really love that she played, Countess Natalie Dupre, who mm -hmm. was the devoted aunt of Josette Dupre. And it's interesting, um, in, in the Dark Shadows fandom, apparently in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of Barnabas and Josette uh, shippers, as we would say nowadays. Yeah. Like that was like a major, like they, some fan before, this was before Etsy um, made these little pillows that said Barnabas and Josette, these little heart shaped pillows that they sold at the conventions. Um, but what I liked about um, Countess Dupre, well, of course I loved her entrance. Um, that was in episode 368. Slash. Why do you use that title? Huh? Okay, answer the question. He said, uh, Joshua said, why do you use that title? Oh, oh right. <laughs> I, was I was born, born with it. it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Still alive. But there was a revolution. That's why I live in Martinique. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those scenes, I love scenes also with Grayson Hall and Louis Edmonds. They played See, very well off. They were just the sparring between the two of them was just fantastic. I was a, I was a Natalie Joshua shipper. I was like, you know, after <laughs> Naomi yes. died and Joshua settled down a little bit, became more sympathetic. I could have seen them getting together. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, take it away. Oh no, that's a great comment. <laughs> that would have been a rather dramatic marriage. Definitely. <laughs> that's right. I, I think I wrote something suggesting that at one point. I was like, hey, come on, what about this pairing? <laughs> And then you see them, I mean, when, uh, you know, later on in 1841 parallel time, the Brutus and Constance uh, yeah. scene. Oh, right. yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. No, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't give me the same vibe. No, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, they were brother and sister too. So That's right. That wouldn't well, have stopped you know, them in Game gold key Thrones. comics. But... <laughs> I love how imperious she was as Natalie too. Yeah. Well, so... it was, I thought it was a great role in terms of Grayson's personal um, thing that you've talked about RJ in your book mm -hmm. because she was very flamboyant and she read tarot cards <laughs> and she would make yeah. happy comments about the food right. oh right. the fish had no flavor I've been told that the cook doesn't use wine it's because of her religion <laughs> <laughs> and, you know here you all treat your emotions like they're right stable in the tropics emotions melt like ice she had just had all those great lines but yeah. she also was like just so devoted to Josette it was obviously yeah. like a surrogate mother mm -hmm. and there's a wonderful scene I didn't write down the episode number where jo where Barnabas has come back from the dead and finally mm -hmm. met up with Josette and Josette comes back and she's so distracted and Natalie's trying to like find out what's going on and then she says 
Josette, I've been talking nonsense and you're not listening to anything I'm saying. <laughs> and she just seems so distressed in that scene. And then in the subsequent scenes leading up to the death of Josette, just um, she does play a lot of vulnerability and um, motherly feeling in a way that to me is very touching. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Agreed, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So um, oh, it, I think my other favorite episode is episode 379, where Natalie's playing cat and mouse with Miss Winters. And that's an amazing episode because in one of, she has a couple of scenes with Vicky and in one of them, Grayson starts to have one of her coughing slash choking fits that she would periodically have because for one thing, Grayson lived with asthma her entire life. Mm -hmm. And um, RJ found out a lot about that that's in the book. And Grayson manages to control the choking and coughing and she just plays it so beautifully. I just feel like, oh, my hat is off to you if I were wearing one. Yeah. It's a great yeah. scene. Um, so I think I'm going to move on to Magda Rakosi. Yeah. <laughs> the, okay. the, yeah. The Roma, well, now we say Roma, that's the preference of the Roma people. But of course, in the 60s, they were called gypsies and I just love how in the first episode Beth comes to have Magda come read the cards for Miss Edith and Magda says I have gypsy cards older than the tarot <laughs> <laughs> sounds great you're stuck you white girl you're stuck with these tired tarot cards I've got the real stuff here <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's fantastic yeah Magda was, uh, I mean, just amazing. What an amazing uh, creation that character uh, was. And of course, uh, Grayson, uh, Grayson's grandmother was Roma, correct? No, she was, um, she was from uh, Moldova. Moldova, Moldova. But, you know, Sam, when I, writing the book, so after the book came out, I got an email from one of uh, Matthew's cousins going, you got my whole family wrong. Oh no. <laughs> said, well, you know, it's from the husband. The husband doesn't care about who was, you know, Grayson's aunt and uncles, or, you know, he would just come into this house and there were all these people there. Right. And who, who's who. So, yeah. And so then he said, Oh, and he would tell the story that, Oh, it was based on her grandmother being gypsy, you know, uh, sold for two oxen. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Bessie was a, 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 a Jewish woman who lived, was from uh, Moldova, and she was the second wife of uh, Grayson's grandfather, and they um, immigrated to the United States in, in the early, late, late 1800s or early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about the whole gypsy story, but the grandmother that I know of, Bessie, was from Moldova. Okay. <laughs> so, but it's still a fun idea. Yeah. Well, those yeah, those scenes with uh, with Grayson and and they are right off the bat. You know, when you get to yeah. 1897, and yeah. they're the first characters you meet. He's like throwing knives or at the calendar. At the yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> knives yet yeah. he's practicing his knife throwing and i think she's looking at the crystal ball and right, right away i mean you can sense that they're having a complete blast playing those characters because they're so right. colorful and steve isn't there the story that they would go to the britney du and like have a couple of drinks and run their lines and you know which was a bar that was right on the corner it's a cafe restaurant now but it was a place yeah. called the britney du yeah, <laughs> you, they, you just you just love thinking about that. In oh, the get, were they in the getups when they were running the lines? Like, <laughs> oh, probably not. No, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> that would imagine. <laughs> Grayson had so much makeup on, and they yeah. more of him was covered up. Grayson had mm -hmm. did her hands and her face, and sure, yeah, and um, so the, I, the, you know, <laughs> the thing is though, again, uh, I, like I said about Nancy Barrett, it, it, I mean. In in the hands of any other actors, these could have just been these stock characters but they're yeah. actually i mean there is depth as we watch the the storyline progress magda and sandor 
loved each other. They truly loved each other. They were the, they were an old married couple. They argued and bickered and insulted each other, but they but underneath all of that, there was real love there. And it was heartbreaking when Sandor dies. I mean, you Grayson was amazing when uh, her her the sadness. You know, it, it really uh, I get choked up when I watch that. You know, it's it's sad. It's really sad yeah. because they did care for each other. Yes. So really fantastic yeah yes that was great that she was allowed to play um a regular married lady i mean well right. there's nothing regular about Maggie, but, <laughs> but a married there. lady with a, a partner of long term right long stage their their interactions like there's that one scene where he comes in and he's like magda give me my soup oh you big stupid here's her soup you know like, <laughs> It's so classic. You just gotta love it. It's great. It's great. <laughs> yeah. So, so Magda, so uh, Grayson played Magda in 59 episodes. And then there's like this fabulous scene in episode 887, which is one of my all time favorite episodes of Dark Shadows, the beginning of the Leviathan storyline, which, um, I would love to talk about more because sure. I personally, it's one of my favorite storylines because yeah. of all the great Julia stuff and some other, like Nicholas comes back and the other stuff. Yeah. But um, that first episode, she has this time warp thing to happen where she's in the drawing room. And at that point they had gotten this thing with the camera where they could do these spot flashes, like interacting flashing between the Barnabas portrait and Julia and um, and Grayson's like basically emoting as she's listening to Magda talk about, oh, they disappeared, you know, and it's just such a great um, moment of uh, Grayson in stereo. There are a couple of other <laughs> moments like that later on where I'm just like about ready to crawl out of my skin because it's twice the Grayson for the same price. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so, so yeah, Magda, um, I think one of the best episodes is when King Johnny, uh, played by Paul Michael, another fabulous theater and TV actor, mm -hmm. um, comes in mm -hmm. to um, in, in exact vengeance upon Magda for stealing the infamous yeah. hand of the infamous Count Batofi. She pulled the bajor. The right. bajor, yeah. <laughs> Gajo and Bajor, those are real Roma words. That are, are they really? In oh, oh. The scripts. Yeah, they're mentioned in other books on the Roma people that I've read. Mm -hmm. And I think Violet Wells has to get credit for that because she would actually do research, unlike yeah. some of the other writers who just didn't have time. Um, and um, But that scene where um, King Johnny summons up the spirits of the ghosts of the dead which was an idea that they got from um the devil and daniel webster the 1941 film yes. with walter houston as old scratch and that's why um humbert used to say nicholas blair was the walter houston role right oh, okay. right he even kind of dresses like with the hat and the gloves and everything yeah he yeah. does <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like a 60s version of that look mm -hmm. um and yeah, I don't have an answer for, well, I don't think Nicholas Blair was the devil because we saw Diabolos, who I'm not sure really was no. the devil because in traditional demonology, there's like this hierarchy of hell, just as there is a hierarchy of heaven. Right. But I don't want to get too metaphysical. On <laughs> get as metaphysical as you want here on this podcast. Well, it, I, anyway, I just love that. I like, I love that she banishes one of the ghosts with the earth. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And another ghost she banishes with her tears. That's so um, magical and very much folk magic yeah. kind of thing. And so it's just so unusual to see that on it. I think now we're starting to see that more with folk horror. Mm -hmm. But whoever wrote that episode, I think it was Violet Wells who wrote it. Mm -hmm. She must have found some folklore about this was one of the, the gypsy magic yeah. techniques as it would have been called then and I just think it's great that they incorporated that in the show agreed yeah it's fantastic yeah it was that's the uh the Johnny uh Romano says it's the catch the weasel is that no and that's the isn't that when they're hunting Magda the after yes yeah catch the weasel yeah 
It's all bogged on. Now we play Hunt the Weasel. Hunt the Weasel. That's oh, Johnny, no, no. Hunt the Weasel. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, Grayson it's... would really throw herself into those <laughs> scenes. Another friend begged me to reenact the scene where she's being haunted by the ghost of Dave Woodard and how he's going. <laughs> Dave, Dave, Dave. <laughs> yes. you, Julia, you have no friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the trial scene is, is with Magda is sad too, because I mean, one of the ghosts is oh. Sandor. One of the, one of the ghosts summoned to the yeah. trial is Sandor that, and she had to banish Sandor. Uh, so she was, did. Yeah. That was, that was, there was a, there's a sadness uh, there as well. Now, are there any other uh, Magda scenes before you, Go to the next character. Oh, there are so many Magda scenes. I know. Well, well, one one you noted just was the whole that oh. whole storyline, right? Just yeah. watch Magda. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it was with Trask, with Gregory Trask, and she oh, calls him a so swine. Great. She calls yeah. him a swine. And she says, "Did you see my wife? Which one?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because of uh, Minerva, because he's you know he's, yeah. he's uh, he has Evan Hanley call up the this image of of Minerva and she's pretend supposed to pretend that she doesn't see her. Uh, right. So when he's when she's interacting with Judith, I, was, I thought that was a great bit too. Yeah, that was uh, another an unusual occult technique that is mm -hmm. um, calling up um, not the actual ghost but like a simulacrum of a yes. dead person. Mm -hmm. And like, how did they find out about that? Because that wasn't really that widely known. I, you know, there are some things that you see a, a lot in um, supernatural shows, but um, that was unusual. They must have had insights, you know, <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I know time is going on, so I don't want yeah. to um, uh, miss out on talking about Hoffman. Yes. Insidious. Now I think Steve, I don't remember. I've never actually seen that that this the night the parallel to Hoffman. I've never seen. Oh, that. you haven't watched 1970 Parallel no. Time? Oh, she was no. great as Hoffman, as Mrs. Danvers. Oh, she was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that it's finally streaming and without commercials, I might watch it now. Yeah, it's <laughs> fun. Uh, there are a lot of fans who like the Leviathan. There are a lot. There are a lot of fans who seem to only you know it's like introduction of Barnabas to. Uh, you know, uh, 1897 and all of those, mm. that stuff. Is, right. So well, there's people gripe about Adam, the Adam storyline too. Yeah. I, I think uh, Leviathan and Parallel Time are really fun storylines and interesting, innovative, unique. And yeah, for sure, Grayson as, as the Mrs. Danvers character was so good. I thought yeah. she did a great job. What were your thoughts yes. on that, Steve? Yes, um, I think that was some of Grayson's best acting because she really um, dialed it down and underplayed. And I think whoever was directing then allowed her to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, one episode, so like a, a thing that's really fascinating about the Hoffman character, she's kind of really like the mirror image. I was going to comment on that as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of Julia, Julia in our time, Julia in our time um, meets Barnabas and falls in love with him, but is trying to redeem him. And when I was in my earlier years of researching Dark Shadows, I actually thought of the entire arc of Dark Shadows as Julia tried to help Barnabas to find redemption. That was mm -hmm. the main theme that mm -hmm. I saw in the show. Now I think it's like more complicated than that because it's just so big and there's so many themes, but Hoffman is, is the opposite and a scene that I chose um, from uh, episode 1015, um, it's when um, Angelique, the Angelique of Parallel Time, um, her, twin, her twin sister Alexis has come back and then Alexis has been killed by the undead Angelique. So I call her Angelexis at that point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> But the, in the beginning of the episodes, they very strongly imply that there was a lesbian relationship between Hoffman and Angelique. But then obviously somebody in the standards and practices offices said, um, this is daytime TV, you know, no lesbians here. They still got away with coding the Louis Edmonds character, the version of Roger. They coded him as a gay man. Um, Coding is a practice that's been discussed by queer cultural 
historians for um, kind of including things like it might have just been the ascot or how mm -hmm. the how the dialogue was written to signal to those who were in the know that a character was was gay or or queer mm -hmm. or however you want to call it. Um, but in uh, that episode ten fifteen. Um, it's just so great, the interaction, because Angelique is like, oh, I feel so so nervous about putting a hex on Quentin. I've never been able to control him. Right. And Julia's like, well, you want him, don't you? Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, yes, but, but I don't really. Have... <laughs> and she hands her the, the voodoo doll and the pin yeah. and goes, come on, cast the spell, do it now. And she's like, <laughs> diabolical and yeah she just does it in like this really matter of fact way that's mm -hmm. in a way very ungracious but very convincing because there's no flamboyant no theatrics she's just like this is a job that we have to do and you're you know I'm giving you the tools now get on with it before mm -hmm. I have to slap you <laughs> <laughs> fantastic um yeah um I think well I think Warren Odson wrote an essay years ago about parallel time. And, um, and when I do the parallel time episode, I want to kind of touch on some of that, but um, that all of parallel time, there are so many inversions when we look at it in comparison to the, the main time band and uh, Hoffman is a, is a big one for sure. She's uh, as you say, she's, she's much more subtle and uh, um, there's a cold, kind of sinister quality there but she's also uh instead of trying to help Barnabas she wants to destroy Barnabas when she uncovers what he is uh Angelique is her closest ally and she as you point out the, the subtext there is she's in love with Angelique as Mrs. Danvers there that subtext exists with Mrs. Yeah. Danvers and yeah. Mrs. De Winter too um so I mean it, instead of being in love with Bart she's in love with Angelique and she's or she's very close with Angelique they're they're uh it's it's a really interesting uh, sort of mirror image of of Dr. Julia Hoffman. It's fantastic, great toward force. I mean, the, the way she plays that character uh, is just kind of chilling, as Mrs. Danvers should be. There's she's intimidating and scary, and uh, and it's it's great when our Julia, the Julia from the main time band, shows up and dispatches the parallel time. Right. <laughs> Hoffman, yep. fan, just great, great stuff. Yeah, I also really love the scenes where Hoffman is taunting the Catherine Lee Scott. Character yes, oh yeah, it's great. Because and I think awful. Catherine Lee Scott <laughs> is also a really fantastic actress. Yes, and, oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. Watching her, um, I don't think uh, Parallel Time Maggie Collins was that great an opportunity for Catherine because Catherine really had she could really play very um, subtle gradations, but they kept casting her as the victim. Mm -hmm. But I just love it. Like she says, uh, Hoffman says something like, oh, when, whenever you would go into Angelique's room, you would feel a warmth there. And then Catherine does get this Zainer where she says, thank you, Hoffman. You're the first person I've ever known to turn an apology into a testimonial. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> That's why, you know, like Dark Shadows, when it was on, it was the best thing you've ever seen because it mm -hmm. was this great dialogue acted by these great actors. Yeah. And I, I personally, I find like where media entertainment is now really boring. It's like all about all this CGI and all these franchises. Yeah. And, um, that's why I tend to watch more stuff now that's older because that's what I, I mean, I like that kind of human and I definitely like the Gothic aesthetic. I'm like really big into the Gothic aesthetic. Yeah. And that, yes, that is why I had the screen name of Gothic. Yeah. <laughs> of course, one of my naughty friends insisted on writing it as Go Thick. And yeah. Right. <laughs> really, my dear, must we degenerate into pornography? Of right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when that was revealed to me, I was like, <laughs> well, when I first saw your screen name, how it's spelled G O T H I C K. I said, wait a minute. Is that, is that what he's going for there? But well, I know you're a big, a huge Gothic 
a fan of, of gothic uh, horror just the gothic genre uh, in in general um and you don't see as much uh, i i always feel that when they try to do a show that is quote unquote gothic they go too far with like the gore stuff and everything yes. like oh we I have agree. to we have to show lots of gore for it to be scary and no that just that that, that totally kills it for me it's all I about agree. You can catch a glimpse of that, but it's all about the. the Everything implied. just goes too far these days, you right. know. I'm just like, yeah. I don't need to see all the sex, man. I I know yeah. what you're gonna do. Just go do it. Close the door. <laughs> yeah, it's like you what know? happened to metaphor. I feel like I've become I've become this prude. You know, I'm all I just don't no. Need to see it's just that. there's no subtlety. It's where's the metaphor? Right. Where's where's what's right. implied? What's what's in the shadows? Yeah. It's we have to see everything. Um, right. but anyway, that's that's another topic for another time. Um, Steve, how about how about uh, do we have do we have more for Hoffman, or are we ready to move to the next character? Well, um, I'll just say a few words about Aunt Julia Hoffman, who's probably the least discussed, um, of all Grayson's characters on mm -hmm. Dark Shadows. Yes, yeah. But Aunt Julia, was in the last storyline, which many fans watch once and then that's mm -hmm. it. But um, there are some really great moments in it, but I think casting had become a problem. As you know, um, Leela Swift had become the producer yes. at that point because Dan was working on other projects among them, the film of Night of Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. And Sam Hall also had to uh, right. write the screenplay single-handedly because Jonathan decided pretty much in December of 70, I think that he was yeah. not going to be in the sequel um, picture, which then turned out not to be a sequel picture at all. It's like its own thing. Right. Um, so I feel like one of the weaknesses of Parallel Time 1841 is some of the casting that just I didn't find the actress who played Josette as an older woman to be very effective. And I, I like um, Keith Prentice as a person, but mm. I just thought he really wasn't well cast or well used. Mm. I mean, I, I guess part of it was the directing, like the director would say, we need more from you, Keith. Right. And he didn't know what to do. And shouldn't have been Julia have been Sarah? Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wonder why she's they... Barnabas's sister. Yeah. She should have been Sarah. Um, she's was... Flora's sister. Oh, that's right. She's Flora's sister, not, not, yeah, not Barnabas's. Yeah. 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 Because, um, yes. There's no Sarah. Sarah, perhaps. Wasn't... I know there isn't. I'm saying but, that, that, that yeah. she's her counterpart. Maybe Sarah was. That would have been more interesting to me. Right. I, I hear you. Yeah. Maybe yeah, there was I Sarah agree. wasn't born in parallel yeah. time. Maybe there was right. no. She was never conceived in the parallel universe. Well, the family doesn't really match up in 1841, in parallel time 1841 with our time. Yeah. Um, but so the, the good scenes for me in that storyline are the scenes with um, between Grayson and John Carlin, another actor oh, yeah. who was incredibly strong and gifted and had this kind of um, edge to him that um, I think he was from Brooklyn or somewhere. He was from yeah. Red Hook, Brooklyn, yep. yep. Yeah, and I mean, just that edge, you know, and and that played well with an edge that Grayson had as a person, but that she seldom actually played on Dark Shadows. And um, just the back and forth between them around his courtship of Melanie. And I think the mm -hmm. Melanie seeds because the Aunt Julia character uh, that Melody was Nancy Barrett's character um, in that storyline um, and Grayson's character was pretty much kind of the surrogate mother because Flora who's like her adopted mother just is doesn't really express much maternal stuff with her the way the storyline was written mm -hmm. um, but yeah um, 1220 episode 1225 it's this kind of showdown between Julia and Kendrick and they're both very strong and she, it seems like she's trying really hard to to talk him into getting the hell out of Collinwood yeah. and then just as she reaches the climax Melanie comes down the stairs in one of her fits going you must all die and it's just <laughs> such a great yeah, <laughs> yes moment. yeah moment and again I love the theatricality of Dark Shadows yeah yeah. 
uh, it, was, it was fun to see Grayson play a Collins. Uh, in, in 1840, she was pretending to be a Collins, but here she actually is a Collins, which I agree, it doesn't really... It, it's, can, it doesn't kind of make a whole lot of sense. Like Julia herself, our time bands, Julia sees the parallel time Julia and she's shocked to see that there's a parallel version of her. And it's like, how did, how did that happen? How does that work? Uh, but it's, it's interesting. I, Wait, I, do, I went to medical school over here, but over there I became a housekeeper. Right, okay. in 1841. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, you know, maybe yeah. it's one of Julia's uh, parallel time ancestors of, of Ho one of Hoffman's ancestors, you know, in, in parallel time. Oh, I meant 1971. Parallel oh, time. Yeah. Go yeah. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see her as a, not only as a Collins, but sort of the defender of the family's mm -hmm. uh, honor and respectability and, uh, right. you know, this whole secret lottery that they have. I thought that was an interesting part of 1841 Parallel Time. I liked the, the Shirley Jackson Absolutely. infusion into, into right. the storyline. And as we, we were talking, Steve and I were emailing back and forth a bit, you know, because uh, Violet Wells wrote some of those episodes as well. Mm -hmm. And she wrote some of the episodes before she officially came on to the show as well. She was ghostwriting for yeah. Gordon Russell. Because as you mentioned, Sam Hall was working on Night of Dark Shadows. Gordon was carrying the load on, on 1841 parallel time on his own. So he brought in Violet to help out and maybe other writers too. I wonder, I'd love to know what went on behind the scenes there in terms of who was writing what. Oh yeah, I, I wish we knew more about that as we were discussing in our emails. I wish we knew more about the production, the day-to-day -day production mm -hmm. um, history, the, how the planning worked, you know, like when King Johnny comes back and is gonna chop off Count Patofi's hand again, they had to find a scimitar. Yeah. And it's a very nice prop. And I don't think they just had those things lying around. Now, maybe um, whoever was in charge of props had to go to some storehouse that ABC had, but sometimes they would go to some of the antique stores in New York mm -hmm. to shop for props, but we just don't know details, you know, like in specific moments, what was going on or anything. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would it, it, and be the whole uh, Rolodex of horror legend, you know, or the, the <laughs> I wish, I wish we knew what was in that and the writers meetings that they, the meetings they'd have with Dan Curtis, you know, what, what was discussed in those meetings, like what ideas were they bouncing around and, you know, it would have been interesting to, to know a, a lot of that, but we'll, we'll surely, we'll probably never know, but, um, but you never know, things turn up all the time, you know, new information, to, like uh, with the Jonathan Frid documentary, we saw some material with regard to, you know, Jonathan not wanting to do Night of Dark Shadows and Dan Curtis not reacting well to, to that situation and, uh, and all of the, the fallout from that. So um, do you have anything else for Julia Collins? Um, before we uh, close, I just want to mention, because I would be remiss if I didn't, that for fans of Barnabas and Julia as a relationship, there were these two key episodes during the infamous 1995 story. Oh, sure, yeah. Episode 1061, written by Joe Caldwell, um, where Julia speaks to Barnabas of getting used to living a life without love. And there's yeah. this close-up on Gray Grayson's eyes. And then she's just like, it's very quiet. She's very still. And it's just hard to watch because she just looks like she's in so much emotional pain. It's heartbreaking. It's and part of us is completely oblivious. Yes, as, you, <laughs> as usual. As Dead usual. Other people suffering. Yeah. As usual, but, yes. But then it's all redeemed in episode 1070 where... Barnabas finds out that Julia's in the thrall of the horrible ghost of Gerard Stiles. Yeah. And she tells him, go to the parallel room, time room, leave me here. I, you know, I'm going to kill you. Don't, don't just get out of here. He's like, not without you, never without, never without you. you. Yeah. Yeah. And for Barnabas, Julia fans, that's like the Holy Grail. That's right. Right. <laughs> that's right. He finally. He and he's her. hugging her and circling on her back while he's saying, yeah. it, you know? <laughs> yes, we've no, committed it to memory. <laughs> it's just an amazing scene. And then they kind of, I mean, the two of them are basically joined at the hip from there on out. But right. there are very few scenes like that. Sure. I and mean, there's like a scene in 1840 where Barnabas tells Angelique um, that she's very important to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are 
they share this bond and it's it and as the show goes on i mean this bond between the two of them becomes very clear i i never i don't do the shipping thing i don't think barnabas will ever reciprocate what julia feels for him but i think he loves julia he cares about julia but barnabas is you know he's a really damaged character i mean he's interest fascinating but he's there's I, I always feel like he would end up hurting Julia, you know, and anybody who loves Yeah, he might him. pretend to commit and then, oh, some other pretty thing would come. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. And also there's the curse to consider right. as well. Like, was, anybody who right. loves you will die. I mean, right. I don't know. I, I would, that Some of that kind of flits across my mind too. Um, it's, just, it's, it's, com it's complicated and it's interesting, but I love that those scenes, it just, it shows mm -hmm. That Barna Barnabas loves does love Julia, even if it isn't in the same way. We're He's so glad Grayson was kind of bored with the character and decided, oh, I'm going to make this yeah, a little more interesting yeah. to play. And it's, yeah. and it's so heartbreaking when that yeah. when Steve described that you know that scene. It's so heartbreaking to see that in her eyes. Mm -hmm. It's it's great. It's really fantastic. Um, Con we didn't talk a little uh, much about Constance. It, it was only one episode. As she didn't do much, right? It, she will. It, <laughs> she wore I a different that, dress, a different style of dress. No, no, I liked. There was some interesting stuff. That, uh, kind of. I mean, we didn't really get to know the character, but it was. Right. It, even then, when she, I love the. I love scenes with her and Louis Edmonds, and mm -hmm. when she he she is he is her brother, and when she finds out that he did kill that he killed Amanda and uh, James Forsyth, her, uh, the, the sort of the horror that she, the, that comes across her face too is, is fantastic. She, she plays that scene really well uh, because she was devoted to her brother and believed in him and was, uh, and she found out he's a, a psycho, he's a killer. He murdered these, these innocent people and just the, uh, as his mask falls away, she reacts and and mm -hmm. I thought that wasn't it was a good scene between them. But any scene with Grayson and and Louis Edmonds, I think, is is really good. So. I agree. I wish that um, the sixteen eighty flashback had been done with two episodes because there's like an entire plot point which was Brutus murdering James's sister. Sarah, oh yes, that was yeah. completely just wiped oh, out, and that yeah. had only been revealed a couple weeks before and I don't know if it was a casting issue or they were running out of time or what it was but um I felt like it needed the flashback needed more build up because the way and they had to really I mean they were actually editing you can tell when you watch it because I just watched it again last night and um they, they had to cut because it had gone on so long but even so it's it's just very compressed Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. They should, they, they should have uh, spread that over like two or three episodes. I mean, I think it deserved some more time than it got. Um, I was talking to a guest in a previous episode, it was Don Glute. Oh, we were talking about 1680 parallel time and how did Colin would exist in parallel time in 1680 and how old does that make the old house in parallel, <laughs> in parallel time? Uh, you know, I, I wish we had gotten a little bit more History. They just kind of would throw these things out there and you figure it's it out. The, the, they didn't have the internet or fans like today. You see sure. a lot of people writing a lot of the shows are fans, you know, oh, yes. just, like the, the Star Trek stuff, the uh, Star mm -hmm. Wars stuff. They're actual fans. So, you know, they have the coda and the Bible in their heart. Yeah. And back then the showrunners really didn't have a system for keeping track of all of this. And right. of course they all thought it was just going to go away. They didn't know we'd be sitting mm -hmm. here 50 years later still yeah. chit chatting about. Or they'd go out and ask the fans. <laughs> they'd ask the right. fans outside the studio what right. happened. No, no, <laughs> yeah. go go ask the kids out on the 57th street. You know? And they they knew <laughs> uh, third street. But uh, it's uh, you mentioned Mark B. Perry at the top of the episode, Steve. He yeah. he would he remarked to me that he has the benefit of hindsight. Like he can go yeah. back and look at those episodes, and you pull things from those episodes right. and try to try to make sense of of some of that, or if if it works for his story. So I, I hope that he manages to get that off the ground because I'm curious to see how that's gonna gonna play out. Yeah, I feel like it'll be a miracle if it happens, but miracles do happen. Hey, well, we have so many of these streaming channels now, and if all these other shows can, you know, get a get a, a slot on uh, on these streaming platforms, why not Dark Shadows? I mean, 
it still has such a big following uh, and it's, you know, yes, it's not at the level of something like Star Trek but I get, these days. I but... get these rushes of for mm-hmm. Grayson's fan book page uh, on Facebook. There is a Grayson Hall fan book page, fan page. I'll get these rushes of, you know, one or two trickle in and then there will be 30, 40, 50 people, you know, signing yeah. up and, and answering. You have to answer the question or I won't let you in the room. <laughs> There's a question. You have to an- answer it. Um, and and so it's it's just astonishing, you know, how many people just still keep finding it or remembering it, you know. Yeah, so. for, for sure. Yeah. That's the most amazing thing to me, because honestly, like, you know, I still remember in 1969, I was was visiting some friends and I said, oh, gosh, I just love what's happening on Dark Shadows. And they were like, you still watch that? <laughs> and I mean, I had a little bit of it was like an early moment of like oh god people don't like my weird stuff <laughs> maybe they don't like me either and Aww. I just remember um in the night in the 90s or late 80s you know as the videotapes had either not come out or were just coming out I was just thinking this is like a forgotten show and then it came on sci-fi and suddenly it had a new audience mm-hmm. and that keeps happening like there are I have a friend who's in her 20s who also has a Strange Paradise blog and she's seen all of Dark Shadows and we talk about it and it's like people do. It's like there are young people who were born long after the last episode aired and Mm -hmm. it's amazing to me because Dark Shadows is everything that supposedly doesn't work now in entertainment. Like it's it's slow. You, You know, it's a lot about character. It's about intricate storytelling that doesn't have that many twists to it and it's mostly about characters that you start to care about like they're members of your own family but obviously people want that (laughs) and it's like Mm -hmm. as usual the suits just don't understand what it is that people really want they look at I don't know what bizarre Baroque stuff. Marvel, is. Marvel, <laughs> oh, multiverse, the multiverse Marvel. Multi- hey, we, you know, we were we had parallel time before right. uh, Marvel was doing multiverse. So. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I guess they were doing that in the comics back. Well, I don't know what these probably. I don't even know. I don't think they were doing that in the '60s in the comics. Well, Star Trek did it. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is a great episode. By oh, it is. Yeah, it's fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of you know, Star Trek, now they have the Strange New Worlds show talk, talking about, and that one is evocative of the of the original Star Trek. Right. At least I'm enjoying the, that. I'm watching that, and yeah. I'm enjoying that. Discovery started out really well, and then went really sideways. Okay. This That's all yeah, I, I, I don't have that one, the Paramount Plus channel, but I gotta I gotta get up, get on that at some point. But um, well, I want to thank the two of you. We didn't really get into the movies. We didn't get to to Julia and House of Dark Shadows and, and Carlotta and Night of Dark Shadows, but that those were also great performances by Grayson Hall as well an interesting yeah. take on Julia too because she's the one who who decides to undermine the uh the cure for Barnabas in that one as opposed to the tv show and Barnab- uh, and her in her role as Carlotta that's Grayson getting to put, pick her own uh, wardrobe <laughs> oh really was, yeah yeah she <laughs> picked she picked those clothes versus oh, those Dr. Yeah. Hoffman clothes, which no wonder she, those that out those outfits are so fabulous that Carlotta's yeah. wearing. I love that. Right. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and it's rumored that the wig she wore uh, used to belong to Rita Hayworth too. Oh, so okay. it was her wig, but it was rumored to have previously belonged to her. Interesting. So. Wow. She's uh she she's a, a bit like Hoffman. I felt in that in yeah. that movie. She has that right. the parallel time Hoffman. Um, but uh, closing uh thoughts here. Do we have um? A website, GraysonHall.net. GraysonHall.net. Uh, you can yeah. order the book there. You can see her screen, screen credits. There's a few things I discovered after the book's publication that I put there. Mm-hmm. And I did, I did mention to you that I'd like to put a plea out to the fans. Yes. Um, I have never been able to um, find much about Grayson's first husband. His name was, his professional name was Ted Brooks. Um, there are a lot of Ted Brooks in IMDb. He is not related to Connor Brooks. Uh, who was an actor and did some cult stuff. But he ended up becoming, uh, the only clue I have about him is that he ended up in Michigan. And when she was in a play there, um, one of her friends, uh, Cece Pulitzer said, Cecilia Pulitzer said, oh, aren't we going to call him? Aren't we going to go see him? And she's like, nah, he's like a forest ranger or something now. Oh, so okay. um, his, his name was Ted Breitbart or Ted Bradbart. 
Uh, maybe he was an alumna of Temple University. Steve, I don't know if you have a way to access the Temple University alumna, but I've just been trying to find out who he really was. And her, of course, her husband didn't know, and her second husband, Sam. So if friends, people want to do help me with some research, that would be great. And if you want to know more to help help me look, just email me through the website. Yeah. And if and uh, feel free, if you send it my way, I will forward it to uh, RJ as well. If you have anybody out there has any information uh, about Thanks. that. Yeah. Uh, and Steve, any, any closing thoughts from you? Any place where uh, folks can see some of your writing? Um, well, I don't really have uh, that much of a dedicated web presence that relates to my fandom mm -hmm. interests. But um, I'm, I was thrilled to be on this uh, conversation. I've had a blast and um, really just thrilled. Oh, gosh, it's, it. it's been my absolute pleasure to have the two of you uh, here with me. Uh, and it's, I'm glad we, we had the chance to do this. And I want to thank you both for taking the time to sit down with me to uh, celebrate Grayson Hall, who was, who was such a beloved uh, actress and characters that she played on Dark Shadows are so well loved by many fans. Uh, and I hope I hope to have this episode out on the anniversary of Julia's first appearance on Dark Shadows on June 30th. Fingers crossed all goes as planned. But thank Great. you so much to both of you. And folks, please do subscribe to the podcast. Keep on subscribing, rate and review the podcast just to it helps the podcast to reach more Dark Shadows fans. Uh, so that, that does help the podcast a lot. So uh, give us a rating, give us a review. Uh, and thank you so much for listening. And for as long as they lived, the Dark Shadows never truly vanished. For there will always be terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production. <laughs>